Are you guys ready to talk about fire and how to investigate arson? I hope you are, because I am. All right, so let's start with what fire and explosions are. So we're going to talk about fire first. But fire and explosions are basically the result of a chemical reaction known as combustion. So if you've had chemistry, then you know what a combustion reaction is. Um, it's basically just anytime you've got a fuel and oxygen coming together. And if you have complete combustion, then that means that you're going to end up with carbon dioxide, water, and energy. And the cool thing about this is if you think about what ends up with carbon dioxide, water, and energy, that's actually something I'm talking about in my biology class right now, and that's cellular respiration. So cellular respiration, if you remember from bio biology, is glucose combining with oxygen. So glucose is the fuel. Oxygen is the oxygen that's coming in. They're combining together, and then you're getting this result of carbon dioxide and water and energy in the form of ATP. So actually your cells right now have a gajillion teeny tiny little combustion reactions that are taking place in there over and over and over again. So there are basically little explosions going on in your cells and that's what's keeping you alive right now. I think that's awesome. Um, okay, so if you look at it like this, a chemical reaction, fuel plus oxygen yields carbon dioxide, water, and energy. That's just a little fancier way of looking at it. So all reactions, no matter what they are, again, if you had chemistry, you remember this, all reactions require the input of some kind of energy. And that energy is called activation energy. So even a reaction that is exergonic, so is going to give off energy, has to take a little bit in to get it started. Um, most of the combustion reactions you're familiar with are fire and explosions, other than that, you know, cellular respiration I was just talking about. And whether you get fire or an explosion is determined by two things. The nature of the fuel. So what's your fuel? Are we talking about wood? Are we talking about paper? Are we talking about um, liquid oxygen? Okay. So what are we talking about? Um, so whatever our fuel is, we're going to get a very different kind of reaction. And then how close are the oxygen and the fuel to each other? So um, are we just waiting for atmospheric oxygen to come in? Are we, do we have the liquid oxygen? Actually, I guess the fuel would be something else. And then the liquid oxygen coming in like right there in it, ready for the explosion to happen. How close are they? How, how quickly are they going to be able to combine? So practically speaking, so like the bottom line Cliff's Notes version is that fire is a slow combustion reaction and explosions are a fast combustion reaction. So fire is slow, explosions are fast. So they're both combustion reactions. It's just a question of the speed. What are we talking about? How fast is this happening? And we'll get more into explosions later. Today, we're going to focus on fire. All right. So if you are going to be an arson investigator, if you're going to be a fire investigator, you have to know all kinds of stuff about fire. So you get to learn tons and tons and tons of stuff about fire. So you have to figure out what a fire is. What does it mean for a fire to get started? What does it take? What does it take for it to keep going? What are the different types of fires? And we're going to talk about those different types of fires. How do you investigate fire scenes? So there's a very systematic way of doing it, just like with every other crime scene, or yeah, every other scene that we're going to look at. What are fire residues and where do they come from? So that's what we'll talk about later. And then what is your job? So if you're the investigator, what do you do? So in order for a fire to take place, um, you need four things. There's the fire centric movement. So this is kind of like low carb triangle.
And then you've got a chain reaction taking place between the fuel and the oxygen. So the flash point is the lowest temperature that will allow a particular liquid to produce a flammable vapor. So we said you have to go from liquid to gas, so it has to evaporate, okay? So we have to become a vapor, okay? And so from that liquid to that vapor, the flash point is the lowest temperature where that vapor now is flammable, okay? Don't confuse that with the ignition temperature. And the ignition temperature is the minimum temperature that you have to get that substance heated before it will sustain a burn. So the flash point will just give you poof out. Whereas the ignition temperature is gonna go poof, burn, 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 burn. So the flash point is typically gonna be a lower temperature than the ignition temperature. Because the flash point just has to get you there and then it doesn't have to sustain. The ignition temperature has to hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, keep producing that vapor, keep making that substance be a flammable vapor. And so you're gonna have to have a higher temperature for that in order to sustain that vapor production as the vapor is getting sucked off by all the fire that is being created there. So you don't need to know these. This is just for perspective. I think it's kind of interesting. So the flash point of propane is negative 156 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you're running around in the woods with a, a propane tank, um, like a little mini propane tank to use for your stove for your or kerosene, which is coming next, to use for your stove, that's a pretty low flash point. So gasoline is negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit. Diesel fuel, sorry, I thought kerosene was in here. I lied. Diesel fuel is between 100 and 130 degrees Fahrenheit. And then motor oil is between 420 and 485. And that makes sense because we want motor oil to be a lubricant inside the engine. And the engine of a, of a car or a truck is really freaking fracking hot. Um, and so you don't want your motor oil to hit the flash point And all of a sudden you've got things burning up inside your engine. You want that to have a really, really super high flash point so that it's not going to ignite while it's in your engine where things are really, really hot. All right. So where do we get smoke from? That's easy. Smoke is just incomplete combustion. So smoke just means that you have a limiting reactant of some sort. And when you've got a limiting reactant, you've got leftovers of something else and that comes off in the form of smoke. So most of the time you have a limited supply of oxygen. There's not enough oxygen getting to your fire in order for your fire to burn as well as you would like it to. That's why if you think about when you are trying to build a fire, maybe a campfire with your propane tank, uh, maybe you have a campfire, maybe you're in the, um, you have a fireplace because it's winter time and you want to keep warm or have a, you know, nice holiday um, winter time theme going in your living room, or maybe it's summertime and you're out at a fire pit. Um, at any rate, your fire starts to smolder and you start to see smoke coming off. You lean over and you blow into it. And if you blow into it, you'll get some of your flames back and you'll get less smoke coming off. And that's because you're giving it oxygen. I know you're like, but I thought we breathed out CO2. You do. You also breathe out oxygen. Um, so when you give it more, when you give the fire more oxygen, you're going to get a more complete combustion and then less smoke. So smoke is just made up of carbon particles and then unburned gases or partially burned gases. So it's just little chunks of carbon. And then whatever gases haven't been burned all the way or, or haven't been burned at all or haven't been burned all the way. Now, you could end up with something called flashback. And flashback happens when you've got a fire that's burning and it's sort of smoldering and it doesn't have enough oxygen. And then all of a sudden you get this whoosh and you suddenly ventilate the fire. And now the fire is going to go bananas. So if you imagine a room. So when I was growing up back in the olden days, um, what they used to tell us to do in the case of a fire in the school is make sure that in our classroom, all the windows were closed and all the doors were closed and then we were supposed to leave. The problem with that is that you start, if there's a fire in our classroom, we starve the fire of oxygen and the fire is going to smolder, smolder, smolder. The firefighters get there, they open up that door, they're going to give a ton of oxygen to the fire that's inside that closed up classroom, that oxygen comes in the fire is going to come sucking out the door at the firefighters. And then the firefighters, you know, are getting injured and all kinds of horrible things are happening. So that's why now they're like, you know what, just get out. Whatever the status of your doors and your windows are, we don't care. Obviously, don't go opening up all the windows so you can give them all the oxygen. But, you know, like don't go to great lengths to contain the fire in here because you're probably not going to starve it until the fire goes away. 
you're probably just going to starve it enough that you make it dangerous for the firefighters. Okay, so accelerants. Accelerants are basically just fuels that are really easily vaporized. So it's really easy to get them to go from liquid to vapor. They support combustion. So they're also really good at sustaining that burn. And they're highly exothermic, meaning they get off, give off tons and tons of heat and energy. So an accelerant is pretty much what it sounds like. It's going to accelerate a fire. It's going to make a fire happen faster. And accelerants are just used when it's difficult to start a fire or if you want to make a fire burn quickly. So you're in a forensic science class. So your first thought is, ooh, yeah, that's if you want to burn down a house, you use an accelerant. But yeah, you can legitimately use accelerants too. So if you are using lighter fluid, charcoal lighter fluid, um, to get a charcoal grill started, that's an accelerant. That's a legitimate use of an accelerant where you just want to speed up the process of getting that charcoal to burn. Because if you're just dropping matches on your charcoal, it's going to take you forever. If you're, you know, building little tents out of, you know, paper and stuff, it's going to take a while. You shoot some lighter fluid on there, that bad boy's going to go up. You're good to go. Now you are going to have burgers that taste like lighter fluid, but you know, that's your own choice. Um, the reason your burgers will taste like lighter fluid is because accelerants often do leave behind residues. So even when they're burned, even when you think they're burned away, there's going to be residue left behind. So some examples of accelerants are gasoline, like in your car, kerosene, like you would take for your stove camping, charcoal lighter, like I was talking about, paint thinner can be used as an accelerant. Now that's not its primary job. Its primary job is to be a paint thinner but it makes a really nice accelerant as well, okay? Um, the ATF, remember that it's ATF, but it's the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives uh, actually has a classification scheme for common ignitable liquids. You don't need to know anything about that except that it exists. All right, so just so you guys know, here's an edit. And this edit is here because of technology. So just like you guys have technological difficulties, I just had a technological difficulty. And I'm kind of going to cry because it's been a really long day, but I'm just going to persevere and push on through. Um, all right, so I am now going to talk to you about things that I just spent a bunch of time talking to you about. So let's hope I remember to say all of the wonderful things that I said before and drop all those pearls of wisdom right there at your feet for you to learn. Um, okay, so from the forensic standpoint, there are three different types of fires that exist. There are natural fires, accidental fires, and deliberate fires. Um, I'll talk a little bit about each of them. We're going to spend a long time talking about deliberate fires. Um, but uh, deliberate is a fire that gets set on purpose. Um, a deliberate fire, just because it's been set on, pur set, set on purpose, doesn't mean that it's arson, okay? Um, arson is a whole nother level. Arson is... Um, a fire that was set with the intent to illegally destroy something. Um, so you really want to destroy something. You want to destroy evidence. You want to destroy the building itself. You want to cover up a crime. So a deliberate fire just means a fire that's on purpose. Okay. So a natural fire is just a fire that was caused by nature, hence the name natural fire. So the main natural cause for fire is going to be lightning. In fact, I cannot think of any natural fire that isn't happening because of lightning. So even like a forest fire is either happening because of lightning or it's happening because of some doof doofus out there in the woods doing something else, which takes us to an accidental fire. So maybe you go, you have your campfire in the woods, you think you've put it out, you haven't put it out all the way, a gust of wind comes through, whoosh, there you go. Um, now you have a fire that has caught on some, you know, maybe some brush or a tree, and now that's going to catch and now you have a forest fire. So that's not a natural fire, that's still an accidental fire. Um, it just happened in nature. Um, other accidental fires are things like a malfunctioning furnace, an electrical fire. Maybe you have a toaster that malfunctions. Maybe the gas dryer has a problem or the electrical electric dryer has a problem. Um, maybe there's an outlet that has a short in it. Something like that is happening. Okay. A deliberate fire is a fire that's set on purpose, not always arson. So when you're setting a campfire, um, when you're lighting a campfire, that's a deliberate fire. You put a fire in your fireplace, that's a deliberate fire. You put a fire in the fire pit, that's a deliberate fire. Um, if you're going to determine that a fire was deliberately set, though, assuming you don't have somebody who's like, yo, I set that fire. Um, if you're going to assume that you, if you're going to figure out that you have a deliberately set fire, it's going to take a bunch of different steps. So you've got to eliminate any chance of a natural or accidental cause. Um, if you want to determine that the fire was arson, you're going to look for some clues. And we're going to talk a ton about these clues uh, a little bit later on. So you're going to look for accelerant. You're going to look for other evidence that tells you that maybe that was 
um, a deliberate fire like multiple points of origin and fire trails. Okay. So when you go to investigate a fire scene, it's really, really hard. These are some of the hardest scenes to investigate. They're going to be wet and dark because probably the fire department has been there spewing water all over the place. Gobs and gobs of water are everywhere. So it's going to be wet. It's going to be dark. It's not like you're going to go in and flip a light switch on a burned out building. The structures are weakened. So stuff could be falling down. You have to be really careful where you go to make sure that things aren't going to fall down on you. There could be smoldering debris. So as you're walking through, you want to make sure you don't kick something. You kick a pile of debris, oxygen gets in there. Now you've got a fire again. The building may have partially or completely collapsed. So maybe the second floor bedroom is actually in the kitchen now. And so you're not just investigating the second floor bedroom. You're not just investigating the kitchen. You're investigating investigating the second floor bedroom kitchen um, because it's all in one place because it fell down in there. You have to provide, you have to um, come in with special attention because you really have to be extra special careful to make sure you don't disturb the scene and that you are protecting any evidence that might be there. It's going to look like a big gigantic mess, but you got to make sure you're preserving any evidence you can. Okay. So if you are highly trained, if you are a highly trained, trained fire scene investigator, um, you know about things like what causes fires, what burn patterns look like. And we're going to look at some burn patterns, how different materials react to fire. What are the characteristics of the point of fire origin? How do fires normally proceed through a structure? So like, do they like to start in the living room, then go get a snack in the kitchen, and then go take a nap in the bedroom? That's not what I mean. I mean, looking at a room and seeing, okay, fire is likely to go in this direction or fire is likely to go in that direction. What's going to happen? What looks not normal? What are the things that make you say, hmm? What are the things that make you look and say, that's not quite what I was expecting to see. What's unusual about that? What are the effects of fire suppression on the scene? So what happened once firefighters got there? Like, what did the firefighters do to this scene? And then you need to know about appliances and you need to know what it looks like when they fail and what it looks like when they've been tampered with. So what does it look like when a gas dryer has legitimately shorted out or had a problem or had the gas come off? What does that look like versus when somebody has tampered with it and pulled that gas line off and, oh, say, I don't know started a fire with kitty litter right there. Um, So what does that look like? You've got to know that kind of stuff so you can recognize it when you see it. The main duty of the fire scene investigator is to determine the cause of the fire. So you've got to figure out what caused this, where, what was the source there? Just like every other crime scene, you need to proceed through in an orderly, methodical way. So you have to go through systematically. This is the drum I've been beaten all semester long. You have to be systematic. You have to be orderly. You have to be organized. You have to be detailed. You have to go through little by little by little by little by little. You can't just go in willy nilly and do whatever you feel like doing. You need to maintain accurate, thorough records. Use still photography. Use video photography. Make sure you're taking good notes. Ideally, you're doing all of that. Ideally, you've got photographs and you've got video and you've got notes to go along with stuff. You're not just trying to let one thing stand alone because they all help each other. None of them can do the job all by themselves. They all require uh, each other. So when you're looking for what started the fire, what was the cause of that start of the fire? When you get in there, what you need to find is the point of origin. So when we talk about angle of impact, we abbreviated it and called it the AOI. We are not going to call the point of origin. We're not going to abbreviate the point of origin because if we do, it's going to be the poo. Um, And nobody wants to go into a fire scene and look for the poo. So we're just going to look for the point of origin. Okay. Um, So if you know the point of origin, that that can help you figure out if we're talking about an accidental fire or a deliberate fire. And part of that is because there might be accelerants present at the point of origin. So if you can get to, okay, here's the place where the fire started. Let's see if there are accelerants here. Oh, there are accelerants here. I wonder why there are accelerants here. Okay. Generally, you're going to have the most intense burning and damage found there, though. So it's going to be a little harder to look at and a little harder to find evidence from. Um, But that's also going to tell you where the point of origin is. You have to keep in mind if there's wind, uh, if the fire department did get there, if maybe the homeowners, homeowners had their little fire extinguisher under the kitchen sink and they tried. What are the effects there? Were there other fuels or accelerants nearby? So if it was a fire that maybe started in the garage and somebody had paint thinner off to the side or paint or, you know, any other accelerant, maybe they had um, an extra an extra propane tank for their grill out back, any drafts coming through, 
all of those things can alter what you think is going to happen. And so you've got to be able to kind of adjust with it. If we're talking about a deliberate fire, the place where the person entered and exited the building could be really, really important because chances are they were being super careful where they were starting the fire. Um, on their way out, they were probably just trying to get the crap out of the building and they weren't paying as much attention. So there is a better chance that there's going to be evidence left behind there. You might find trace evidence, you might find fingerprints, you might find shoe prints, hair, fibers, soil, blood, any kind of thing like that. You got to check out the points of entry and exit, um, as well as it's going to come up later anywhere where they may have been while they were setting the fire. All right, so if we're going to locate the point of origin, um, we're going to look for certain characteristics. So the first thing is you should be able to find the point of origin on this picture. Um, if you can't find the point of origin on this picture, I am going to judge you hard because it says point of origin right here, and then there's an arrow, okay? So right here is our point of origin. So knowing that now we can go back and we can look at all the various other clues and you'll go, aha, I knew, I totally knew that's where the point of origin was. Um, so one of them is low burning. We know, you guys all know that fire burns up. You guys all at some point held a match and you watched the fire go. And then at some point you went, I wonder what'll happen if I do this. And you went like this and the fire burned up and then it got hot and you freaked out and you dropped the match. And then your mom was like, ah, you're going to set the house on fire. Um, and then you probably did that again. I would like to say you never did that again, but I'm sure you've done it again since then. But at any rate, you know that if you hold a match like this, the fire is going to burn up. If you hold a match like this, the fire is going to burn up. OK, so the fire is going to burn in an upward direction. So you're going to look down to find the point of origin. It's going to be the lowest place where the burning is taking place. You can also look for a V pattern. So in this picture, you can see here's the bottom of the V and you can see an angle up this way. Okay, now there's not as much of an angle up on this side because it looks like this door was closed. Okay, so this door was probably closed during the fire, which means you're not gonna get that V pattern because there's no other side for that V to come up there. You're gonna see charring of wood. So a char pattern is just, um, that really dark black burning where you've got hot fire burning on something. If you've ever, ever had a char burger or a char dog, um, that's the kind of burger or dog that has the grill marks on it because it's been charred. It's got the dark black marks on it. Plaster and concrete do this thing called spalling. Um, this is what spalling looks like. So you can see where it's almost like the plaster or the concrete is peeling away. It got so hot that a layer just like peeled off. So you've got the sooty outside and then you've got the peeled edges. That's what the spalling is. Um, material distortion. So certain materials are going to kind of melt and mush and turn into different sort of distorted shapes. And we'll take a look at what happens with glass. And then you'll see soot and smoke staining around the area of the point of origin as well. And you can see that in this picture.